Welcome back. This is actually our last video with code, and we'll be wrapping up our gameplay stakes. If you remember from the last video, we have a few things that we want our game mode to handle while we're playing uh, versus when we've won or when we've lost the game. And that is, we did set up that all states have the HUD text, and we also want the spawn volumes to be spawning while we're playing. We want the spawn volumes to stop spawning when we've won. We also want the spawn volumes to stop spawning when the game is over, but at that point we'll also have the character ragdoll, and we'll disable, play disable player input. In the last video, we set up the code we needed for the spawn volume to toggle whether or not it would spawn, and we also registered all the spawn volumes in the level with our game mode. Really quick, before we get started with the state handler that we're going to make in this video, we do need to change a little bit about that code from the last video. So I put the uh, code to iterate through whether or not, uh, or sorry, go through the level, collect all of the actors, figure out if they were spawn volumes, and if they were spawn volumes, store them in this spawn volume actors array. What I didn't do is we need to actually remove this, cut it out, and then move it up here before we start playing, or before we set our current state to playing. And that's because when we set the current state to playing, we'll handle our new playing state, and in doing so, we need to already have the spawn volume actors array populated and ready to talk to. So you just need to move this block here, of finding all the spawn volume actors, so this whole block, just move it up right under that super begin play call. And that way, once we set the current state to playing, everything will already be stored in this array to work with. So once you do that, now we can start working on our state handler. And that's gonna be here on our game mode. It's also going to be a private function because we're only going to call it from within game mode code. And it's going to be a void function. We'll call it handle new state because that's what it's going to do. We're going to give it an e battery state, an e battery play state called new state. And we're just going to make a quick note here that this will handle any function calls that rely upon changing the playing state of our game. And the body of this function is really going to be a simple switch statement. We'll put that down here at the bottom, right here below set current state. So again, void a battery collector game mode. Current state. And it's going to take the same argument, so I'm just going to copy that right here. And this is going to be a really simple switch statement. And it's going to switch on the value of new state. So basically the function will look and see, okay, what's the value of new state? If it's uh, playing, do these things. If it's one, do these things, etc. and so forth. So I'm just going to fill this block out with a little bit of pseudocode first so that we can make sure we get all the function calls entered in that we need. And of course, we've got our different case statements. So they're all based on our four states of the battery play state. So we have playing. And after each of these, we're just going to break because there's not going to be any overlap. So I'm just going to take that. And we'll just really quickly copy these because we're going to have the same format for all four of them. And we'll go through and fix the enum values in just a moment. So this is, if the game is playing, the next one will be if we've won the game. So we'll change the enum to e1. The next one will be if we've lost the game, and this will be the game over. And then finally here we'll have the unknown default case. And that's just will be helpful for debugging if for some reason we forget to call um, handle current state so that we don't have a, a default or we don't have a playing one or game over state set. So you could put, say, a debug string in here just to detect if you ever did fall into this part of the switch statement. 
And we'll also put default right above this. So those will be the two cases where we um, do nothing. But again, you could put a debug statement in here if you wanted to make sure that uh, you never entered into this part of the loop. Actually, let me just indent all of this a little bit. There we go. So again, we've got, for if the game is playing, we want the spawn volumes to be active. If we've won the game, we'll have spawn volumes be inactive. inactive. If you've lost the game, we will still make the spawn volumes inactive. But we're going to do a couple other things too. We feel like it should have a little bit more impact, such as, um, you know, we're going to block player input. And we'll also uh, ragdoll the character. And so basically, we just need to make sure that we put now function calls below all of our pseudocode. So we'll go through handle current state, which will be called and based on the value of new state. We will either set the spawn volumes to active if we're playing, make them inactive if we've won. We'll also make them inactive if the game is over, but then we'll also block input and ragdoll the character. And because we've already gone through up here at the very beginning of begin play, and stored our uh, spawn volume actors in an array, we can access them really easily here in our handle current state function. So we're just going to go through a loop of all the actors in that array and set their spawning active to true. So that's a very simple for loop. And we've already got spawn volumes included because of the work we did in the last video. And we're going to say for each volume in our array of spawn volume actors, move that back after I finish with the code there, we will call that public function that we set up in the last video of set spawning active to true. And it's actually going to be a very similar loop for inactive uh, spawn volumes as well. So we're actually going to copy that. Uh, copy. Go ahead and save. And this pseudocode for spawn volumes inactive, or our comment line rather, we will put the same loop, but rather than setting spawning active to true, we will set it to false. And we can actually copy that exact same block now with the spawn volumes being inactive or deactivated here below the same line here in game over. So now, uh, once we begin playing, the spawn volumes will all be activated. And once we've won the game or lost the game, they'll all be inactivated. So we can actually go over to the editor and compile, and we can test this out. And then we'll go through and add the input blocking and the ragdoll. But if you remember, we changed in the video before this, we changed the spawn volumes to only start spawning once that set spawning active has been set to true and the timer has been set the first time. Oh, the compile failed. Let's take a quick look at why that might be. Oh, actually doesn't think that that's a current member. Did I put that in the wrong wrong source file? Let's just take a quick look. Nope, that's right there. Handle new state, play state. But it is reminding me that I never actually called it here. So right after we set the current state, we're going to call handle current state. That's what I did, handle new state versus handle current state. Just a little bit of a typo there. So handle new state. And just double check that I set that array to spawn volume actors up here. Yep, spawn volume actors. So we'll hope that IntelliSense catches up with us in just a moment. Because that array should be right here on our game mode header. 
So what I was doing here was right after we set the current state, now we need to handle it. And we can just do that with a quick call and supply current state. They're actually at this point both equal. We'll go with current state. Now we can save and switch back and compile again. All right, so the compile is finished and we can now test it out. And we've got two spawn volumes in our world now, but if we wanted to add three or four and give them all different pickups to spawn, the game mode and begin play would go through and register them all and then set them all to start spawning. So if you notice here, oh, I need to rebuild lighting for one thing, but also our spawn volumes have started spawning if I let my um, power keep draining down. Actually, it might be easier if I just win the game, so let me just quickly collect those. I win, and no more batteries are spawning. It's a little bit harder to tell with the blocks because they don't get destroyed when I collect, but uh, the batteries are no longer spawning. So let's go through and add those last couple things to our state handler. And I'll actually start lighting rebuilding while I go and do that, so that that's ready to go. All right, so back in Visual Studio in our state handler, we had these other two lines of comments that we needed to work with. And to disable input, we're going to use cinematic mode, and then we're also um, just going to ragdoll the character using some physics. So we need to get the player controller. And we're using gameplay statics again, but this is a function library that we used before, so we don't have to go and include something else at this point. So we're getting the player controller using, and if you've been in blueprints, you've definitely seen these nodes of, say, get player controller. In fact, I think we used get character and get game mode in our HUD earlier, so it should be fairly familiar at this point. If you had a multiplayer game, you would have to do a little bit more work here, but this is a single player game setup, so we don't necessarily have to give it a different ID or anything like that. And then if our player controller exists, like if that succeeded, and that's just a good uh, check in general to try to do when you're working in code, just make sure everything's valid before you start trying to work with it, then you can set cinematic mode. So if we'll open this up, you'll be able to see the arguments. Uh, and again, this is default behavior that's included on the player controller so that you could handle cinematic mode. Uh, so if you notice here in the list of parameters, there's if it's in cinematic mode, if it's true, which we're going to have entering, um, true to disable movements, and true to disable turning. So this is how we're going to um, start disabling some of our input. So cinematic mode, and there's like, several other ways you could do this. This is just a very simple way to illustrate how you could uh, set it up. So we're going to say true, we're entering cinematic mode, and actually we're going to go to the, it's not going to hide the player, it's not going to affect the HUD, it is going to affect movement, so that's true, and it is going to affect turning. So it looks like there were two different sets of arguments for that one, we're going for the slightly more um, involved one because we don't want our player to disappear, we don't want the HUD to change at all, because we do have that game over text that will display on our HUD. So that is how we're going to block the player input. Now to ragdoll the character, and also make it so you can't have just the capsule jump, we're going to work with the character here using a very similar setup. So I'm just going to use the gameplay statics again. And we don't have to do any specific casting to our type of character because we're working, again, on that root character that's included in Unreal with the movement controls and everything that comes along with that. We do, however, have to at least make sure it's a character and not a pawn because uh, characters have that additional movement set and a mesh that is uh, a skeletal mesh, that kind of thing. So get player pawn. Actually, I see get player character there. Let's just do that and then we don't have to do the casting. And this zero, so it's the same sort of argument set as there on get player controller. 
Again, we're going to check if it's valid before we start working with it. Just good practices. And then on the character, we're going to get the mesh. And then we're going to set simulate physics to true, which is going to make it ragdoll and just sort of generally collapse after we lost the game. And then finally, we'll still work on the character's movement component. Get movement component. And uh, make its movement state that can, whether or not it can jump, be false. It could be some other fun gameplay functionality you could do with switching this on and off, but right now we're just going to toggle it off so that once the character is ragdolled, you can't still um, have your capsule be jumping. So that's actually the last bit of code in our state handling. We've got this unknown default state where we don't do anything. Um, really quick, let's compile this and test it out, and we'll turn our JK rate up uh, just so we can show sort of the game over state really quickly can do that actually right here in the blueprint while that's compiling because we did make that an exposed variable so let's make our decay rate something really crazy like 10 times higher than it was before and go ahead and save that blueprint and we'll come and tweak that actually in the next video so the decay rate is he's really the material is changing quickly his power bar is draining quickly now he's actually become blue and pretty soon the game will be over and well, my input is off, but I didn't end up collapsing. And I can't jump, but I didn't actually collapse. Let's go see what might have caused that. All right, I'll take a quick look and then check back in with you. OK, much like when our battery fell to the world because we didn't have a physics body on it, our character also does not have um, no, he does have a physics asset. Let's see. Yeah, it's just not associated. So let's right click on that um, skeletal mesh for the mannequin and create here at the top a physics asset. And go ahead and go with the defaults and save that really quick. Okay. See if he falls into the ragdoll position once we've lost the game. Let's just check this out really quick. There he goes, whoop. <laughs> so one last tweak, obviously there, we need to make sure that he uh, blocks the world. So we'll go to his, uh, actually we'll go to the blueprint, for the character, find the mesh, and let's look at the physics. So when we set simulate physics, we've got constraints, and Okay, so I did a little digging about why our character is falling to the floor like that. And it turns out there's actually some new collision presets. So if you go and open up your character blueprint, so here in the uh, third person folder, open your blueprint and your third person character, and then select the mesh here under components, we can scroll down to collision. And if you notice, there's collision presets with character mesh, but it's actually for query only, and we actually we do want it to collide. So switch that to custom, which will keep all the settings, but then make them able to be changed. We'll just change query only to collision enabled. And looks like that matches up with pawn. So we'll compile and save and go test one more time. It's a good thing we made that uh, decay rate faster. It makes the testing a little bit easier. And again, with collision, when you have issues like that, it's best to make sure that both objects have their um, correct channels to match up and look now he's uh, just ragdolled there on the floor so in the next video we'll do some polish and 
really get our level completely fleshed out. Thanks. <laughs>